Hello, gentle students, gentle readers of the novel Home Among Dream of the Red Chamber. In this second part of this presentation on the aesthetics uh, of the Qing Dynasty, the sort of material culture, I would like to focus on the lives of people who lived during the time the novel was authored, the people who lived within that material culture and what it, what it was like for them what were some of the expectations. And I should give you a bit of a, of a warning. Uh, there are a few images that derive from a Ming and Qing erotic plates. And so they are, well, we could say erotic art. But then again, too, I think it's really crucial for us in, in terms of understanding uh, practices such as foot binding, which we'll, which we'll touch upon, uh, understanding the whole ideal behind foot binding and the whole ideal behind uh, behind really behind sexuality and gender, certainly in the American context with its puritanical, uh, more prudish sort of background, um, sometimes looking at erotic prints can be a little bit um, maybe off-putting for some. But in any case, uh, as an academic lecture, there'll, there'll be some that are rather suggestive. But I want to talk a little bit about the lives of men and then the lives of women, and. Uh, the first thing to make clear really is that the lives of men were essentially the lives of peasants. The great majority of men during the Qing dynasty and during China's imperial history, uh, the great majority of, of men was that was that of a life of working in the fields. The very character for nan, for man, is the character for a field on the top and, and combined with the character for strength on the bottom. So it's it's how one puts his strength, his effort into cultivating the land. That's the character for man. That's how we say a male is, a, is one who works in the field. Um, so while most were peasants or farmers, some uh, worked for wealthy families as retainers. Of course, some were able to uh, pass through the exam system and become officials and become very wealthy uh, as merchants also. But uh, the, objective, uh, the objective really for uh, men was uh, for males to pass the imperial exam system and to become an official. Uh, in this sense, we refer to uh, a man who has passed the exam system as a literatus. And by literati, we mean those educated elite who, uh, who have attained a certain cultural refinement. They've studied the Confucian classics. They've also mastered certain cultural practices such as painting and calligraphy and even, even drama. Uh, I think most of the cultural elite males were very savvy to, to drama. And you, you see in this slide here, by the way, uh, the series of, of cells that were used during the civil service exam system, the imperial exam system. Very large complexes were devoted to uh, uh, facilitating a place for uh, males to take the civil service exam, the, the so-called uh, uh, So thus intellectual orthodoxy was codified within these exams, with, within, uh, with what was expected of one to master to take the exam system. Um, just as I think in, in our modern context here, at least in the United States of America, we have such a, a diversity of topics that we study that there's very little common ground in terms of what one reads and studies, such as in the past one, if you were a student, one would have studied Latin, one would have also perhaps studied Greek and have read Homer and would have read Shakespeare. And there would be a certain, uh, a, a certain canonical group of texts that one would have learned in the West. In China, that codified canonical group of texts were the Confucian texts. So, so the civil service exams, the imperial exams were decidedly Confucian. Um, uh, it, they consisted of, uh, of, of studying fundamentally, the, the, in the, in the, certainly in the Ming and Qing dynasties, beginning in the Song dynasty, one would study uh, four books. And you see in the slide uh, up the upper right, you see Si Shu, the four books. Uh, and these four books that were combined into one text by a Song dynasty scholar named Zhu Xi. Now, Zhu Xi lived uh, 1130 to 1200. Uh, these these four books were you know in a way the kernel of of neo confucian orthodoxy uh really representing mostly Zhu Xi's ideas there were other neo confucian thinkers many of them actually but uh, when one passed the exams 
if you, you master the four books, you master the other Confucian classics, you take the exams, which were quite rigorous. Uh, in fact, uh, when I outline to my students how rigorous the exams were, they're, they're often very astonished. They think, well, um, we thought our exams were difficult, but these are quite, uh, quite uh, intense exams that one would take. And uh, one would be entitled to certain sartorial privileges. You could wear certain things, a certain cap or robe. But there were uh, <clears throat> fundamental levels, such as the, the, the sheng yuan, the zhu yuan, and the jin shi. The sheng yuan level, uh, was the lowest level of the exam, the so-called, um, I would say, the the the, um, the county level exam. You would take this exam; it's incredibly difficult, but still the easiest. And if you passed, you would you would be called a shengyuan, and then you could wear a distinctive cap and a sash. Uh, you would also be exempted from from labor service, so you couldn't be conscripted into into uh, uh, corvée labor. If that was if that was happening in your area, and then you would if you were it passed this county exam and had become a shengyuan, then you would take the provincial exams, more difficult than the previous level, and if you passed those, you would be given the title of juren, someone who was distinguished. If you then passed the juren exam, the provincial, then you were entitled to take what we call the palace exam. Now, this is a very oversimplified of sort of account of what these exams were like and what the system was like. But if you passed the, the county and the provincial, then you were eligible to take an exam at the palace level, which meant that you literally sat for your exam in the Forbidden City. And uh, one would go into the Forbidden City and there, there are three main halls, what we call the outer part of the Forbidden City. And then one would sit for the imperial exam in the Forbidden City and the, the highest level exams, according to tradition, although this probably wasn't the case, certainly, certainly wasn't the case, um, the highest level exams then were allegedly graded and scored by the emperor himself. So once you pass the so-called Jin Shi um, uh, exam, the highest level of the exam, you were quite a distinguished scholar within, within the realm. Uh, now, despite the ideological idea, uh, or the even, we call it the ideal, that anyone could, any male could take the exams, most male, there were certain groups that were, uh, that were not allowed, but, but by and large, any male in the empire could take the, the civil service exams and, 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 and pass and move, move up, right? Despite that ideal uh, that anyone could rise to the top, Almost all of the title hold, hold, almost all the title holders had come from wealthy families, uh, and that's because the wealthy could afford to hire tutors, and they also their sons had leisure time enough to study and memorize the requisite text. One recalls in the novel *Dream of the Red Chamber* uh, that there is a family school, the Jia family school, in chapter nine. There's a very animated, very animated account of Jia Baoyu. And and his friend in 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 uh, in a kind of a, uh, a, an upheaval within the classroom. But that is in one of these private family schools provided by a wealthy family, so that the the young boys could then study for the exams and and become distinguished. And then two, uh, we could say that once one would pass the exam. Once one would become distinguished, especially the, 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 uh, the provincial and palace exams, once one moved up to the Juren and Jin Shi exams, then one often would be um, appointed to official posts and often they would then be able to, uh, they would either be moved into the local magistrates, the Yaman as they called it, the magistrates uh, estate, or they could afford to buy their own or build their own fantastic estate with intricate gardens. The typical Chinese estate, like the Beijing courtyard houses, is shielded from public view. Once again, to return to the theme I talked about in the previous uh, half of this lecture, uh, the theme that, 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 that in propriety, one should exist within a walled structure. Uh, one is shielded from public wall, public view by high walls. Only the invited were uh, able to see these rooms and gardens. So it was these in these private settings that that male associations were made. You see the, the what we call guanxi today, uh, relationships, connections, but also the women's quarters were also 
uh, very elegant. We call Qin Shi's room in, in, in Hong Lo Meng, in Dream of the Red Chamber. But it was the habit of these refined literati, each literatus male. Uh, it was the habit to collect paintings, to collect things like antique bronzes. It was part of the whole Confucian uh, love of, of antiquity. The, the Confucian term for that is hao gu. Um, the word hao means good, but if you give it the fourth tone, you know, hao just means good, but hao means to be fond of something. Hao gu means to be fond of the past, to be fond of antiquities, to even be fond of antiques. And that was something that was very commonly practiced within, within gardens and within uh, wealthy family estates. But what about the women? Uh, the women had very different lives than the men. Uh, often would occupy many of the same spaces, but had very different expectations for what they did on a diurnal uh, basis. What were they doing while well, men uh, lounged in their gardens, in their studios, reading texts? They were expected to do, quote, womanly things. Um, well, uh, women could study the classics, but they studied the classics for women. Uh, and they would, uh, uh, they would sew, they would attend to housely, uh, household duties, housely chores. Let me read you a passage from, and I have two passages that I wanna read, I think at least, at least one, perhaps two passages that I would like to read to you in, in this lecture. But one of them is from a, a woman who lived from 45 to 116 AD, and her name was Ban Zhao. She was the sister of Ban Gu, uh, about whom I wrote my very first book. And my dissertation research was on Bangu, this Han dynasty historian. And Banja wrote a book. Um, the book is about womenly qualifications. And that text that she wrote became ex extremely influential in the domain of expectations for women during the, uh, uh, the time of Imperial China. So really from the first century AD until in a way the present, um, her text would be influential. But she said this, a woman ought to have four qualifications, womanly virtue, womanly words, womanly bearing, and womanly work. Now, what is called womanly virtue need not be brilliant ability, exceptionally different from others. Womanly words need be neither clever in debate nor keen in conversation. Womanly appearance requires neither a pretty nor a perfect face or form. Womanly work need not be work done more skillfully than that of others. To guard carefully her chastity, to control circumspectly her behavior, in every motion to exhibit modesty, and to model each act on the best usage. This is womanly virtue. The text continues. To, cho to choose her words with care, to avoid vulgar language, to speak at appropriate times and not to weary others with much conversation may be called the characteristics of womanly words, to wash and scrub filth away, to keep clothes and ornaments fresh and clean, to wash the head and bathe the body regularly, and to keep the person free from disgraceful filth may be called the characteristics of womanly bearing. With wholehearted devotion to sew and to weave, to love not gossip and silly laughter, and cleanliness and order to prepare the wine and food for serving guests may be called the characteristics of womanly work. These four qualifications characterize the greatest virtue of a woman. No woman can afford to be without them. In fact, they are very easy to possess. If a woman only treasures them in her heart, the ancients had a saying, quote, love of, uh, is love afar off? I desire to love, then love is at hand. So can it be said of these qualifications? Now, it goes on to talk about how a woman should be obedient to her in-laws, uh, obedient uh, as, as a woman um, should be, uh, of course, chaste and in a way restrained. Um, but women in Dream of the Red Chamber, uh, this is Ban Zhao, I think I skipped a slide here. Um, from a, a very fine uh, image of her. I should say, if you look at this woodblock print of Ban Zhao, she uh, really was uh, someone who was considered to be highly literate and who in fact did study the classics quite uh, 
quite diligently. In fact, when her brother Bangu passed away, Ban Zhao is said to have finished the book with a staff of the empire's greatest and most elite scholars working under her to finish the text. In fact, I, I like how it describes the scholars who went into the room when Ban Zhao walked in. When she would walk in, they would all cower below. And uh, in a sense, in awe of her, they would follow her instructions and work on the text. Now, um, now in the, in the novel Hong Wo Meng, uh, Dream of the Red Chamber, women uh, represent, among other things, a more desire-causing aspect of womanhood. Um, you notice in Ban Zhao, there was uh, an emphasis on not being clever and not being pretty. But in Hong Lo Meng, there's an emphasis on being clever and being pretty. Uh, the women who one uh, uh, encounters in the novel, such as Xue Baochai and, and Lin Dayu, they're very, very clever. And they go against something that Confucius said in the Analects, uh, Chao Yan Ling Si, Xian, uh, Xian Yi Ren, uh, someone who is beautiful and clever of speech is seldom uh, a benevolent person, right? Didn't say never, uh, Confucius said seldom. But here we need to consider women in light of the late imperial notion of Qing, of passion. There is a push back against these Confucian notions that one sees in Hong Lo Meng. Uh, the Qing dynasty cult of passion, you know, Qing dynasty is a different character, Qing for Qing passion. But these, these, uh, these women of the cult, the cult of passion actually preferred women who were beautiful and, and, and clever. But they were beautiful in a way that was very specific to, uh, specific to imperial China. They were weak, they were frail and even sickly. So you see in this image, uh, these two lovers, he's, he's actually sort of flirting by lifting her, her robe. Uh, and, and if you look at her, her robe is, is so large because she's impossibly small, impossibly frail, and her head is tilted forward because, well, she's, uh, according to the cult of Qing, likely to be too weak to even hold her head erect. Think of Lin Dayu. Lin Dayu was always sickly in the novel, and very frail and very fragile. The, the cult of passion was attached to women in several uh, Ming and, and Qing uh, 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 Qing dynasty works of, of literature. Uh, these, these texts are sophisticated and philosophical in, in very, uh, very complex ways, in very admirable ways. They're not at all vulgar descriptions uh, merely intended to simply titillate the reader. Um, certainly there is that attempt to, uh, in a sense, arouse the reader a bit, but, but there's much more to it than that. It was indeed common for uh, uh, for uh, a spouse and, and uh, one's husband and wife to read some of the more uh, erotic uh, works of literature before retiring in the evening. A kind of uh, literary foreplay, in fact. Well, now here we have uh, our first sort of example of, of, uh, of a more suggestive image. Um, but I want to talk about foot binding, this, this, this practice that, that, um, that really marks uh, uh, imperial China, uh, especially from the Song Dynasty until the Qing Dynasty, and even into modern China. We, we see, I mean, I, I personally was in China in the 1990s, and there were still women who had had bound feet. Uh, they're quite elderly, but they still had them at that time. But, but one aspect of late imperial China that combined Confucian ideals of feminine virtue and the cult of passion is certainly the practice of foot binding. Um, curiously, this practice is, is only hinted at in the novel Dream of the Red Chamber. Um, but in the novel, Bao Yu spends a lot of time drinking with the girls on his kong, and the girls probably would have had a bound feet, and one sees, too, that there are moments where Grandmother Jia is having, she needs to be helped as she walks. Several, several of the women have, have maids that support them as they walk, likely because um, it's difficult to ambulate with these, with these bound feet. The first point I should make here, if you, if you look at the slide at all, uh, you can see in the bottom left um, that foot binding is not, not merely a practice of just having small feet, right? It's, it, it, there's more to it. There is a, 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 a deforming, a breaking of the foot. It's, a, it's something that is much more brutal than I think a lot of people assume. But it's also erotic, but it's not merely erotic. It's, it's also rooted in Neo-Confucian ideas, right? That is, to keep women restrained 
and in a way away from the male gaze. Despite China's openness, I think, regarding sexual practices and ideas, it's really a much more modest culture than one might assume. It's, it may be less, I think, prudish than our own uh, Puritan or origins, but, but nonetheless, uh, uh, there is a great deal of modesty in, in, in the way China presents these things. So what was foot binding really? What was it? Well, um, some sources say that it's been present uh, all the way back to the Xia dynasty. We really don't know. Most scholars uh, assume that it, it, we know that it probably emerged from, uh, uh, from the latter Tang dynasty during the reign of one of the kings, King Liu, uh, reigned 961 to 975. And according to one uh, legend, uh, so you can see here uh, uh, an x-ray of a of, of, uh, foot that has gone, gone through the process of foot binding. Um, yeah, so um, one, of the, one of the things that scholars have really debated that then is when, when did it emerge and what's the, what's the history of foot binding? But there is a legend and, and this legend here is, is represented with this image of, of the, the, the courtesan dancer by the name of Yao Niang. And she was, according to tradition, she was um, a consort of this later Tang king by the name of Li Yu. And according to the accounts, she constructed a six foot high lotus platform upon which she would dance. And her, she had these impossibly tiny feet that were, quote, bound into the shape of a new moon. And uh, according to this, this uh, image that you see here, certainly there was an idea that her shape were, her feet were shaped like this new moon because they were broken and formed because of foot binding. Um, according to some Chinese accounts, other court ladies then begin to mimic Yao, Yao Niang's uh, feet. And then we begin to see, at least during the Song Dynasty, that in, in erotic prints, uh, there is certainly the practice of foot binding already by the Song Dynasty. So certainly we have representations of it, of, of it and during the Song and textual evidence of it bef before then. But, but then again, if we see that foot binding is really flourishing during the Song Dynasty, then we can say that it corresponds roughly with the advent of Neo-Confucianism, right? Um, while Han women uh, 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 perhaps bound their feet, uh, that would be Han racially, not women from the Han Dynasty, but Han Zhu, uh, racially Han women bound them, their feet from the Song Dynasty to the 21st century. During the Qing Dynasty, Manchu women were not allowed to bind their feet. Right? So um, that's uh, an important distinction. Well, um, bound-footed bound -footed women appear in most aspects of Chinese society and the erotic prints. Clearly we see in the right, this erotic print. Uh, the, the, the idea, I'll go back a slide if I can here. You see uh, that bound feet then are part of what constitutes um, sexual pleasure. Um, during uh, intercourse, it's the feet that are enjoyed uh, during during the during the act of sexuality, so so then again, uh, whereas in the West um, th there is a kind of a notion that certain anatomical parts of a woman's body are are erotic, particularly erotic. In China, certainly it's the feet. So that um, so that when you see images such as this one, you see that the feet, the bound feet, are foregrounded. So that in this erotic image, the feet are emphasized, they're underscored as perhaps the most important part of the, of the arousing dimension of the image. But um, bound-footed women appeared in almost all aspects of Chinese society. I mean, women in, uh, or, or men who played women in Chinese opera wore stilts so that their feet looked like they were bound. Here in this slide, we see that burial effigies used, uh, these effigies used during funerary rites, the burial effigies also had women with bound uh, feet. Almost all erotic prints displayed prominently the, quote, enjoyment of the bound feet. But the reality is, the reality of bound, bound, uh, foot binding is something that uh, historians have become increasingly interested in. 
Um, the reality is this, uh, generally girls from about five to seven years old, uh, they endured this, this practice. Their toes were wrapped, uh, 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 toes and instep were broken, and the flesh of the sole was sometimes made to rot and be removed to enable the foot to be uh, 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 made into a smaller form of, of foot, of feet. Um, I do have a little passage here I should read to you um, uh, as I as I uh, as I discuss foot binding by a, a, a scholar uh, by the, in the 1930s, a man by the name of uh, Yao Ling Shi, and Yao Ling Shi was a so-called quote lotus addict. The lotus was the is a euphemism for the bound foot. So he's an addict of the bound feet, and he he collected poems and stories and anecdotes. But he he published his his work on foot binding in four volumes uh, entitled Records of Gathering Fragrance, the Cai Fei Lu. And um, he, he uh, wrote these four volumes. In these four volumes, he writes a lot of foot binding. But uh, he has this account of a woman who talks about the experience. So let me read that to you. Uh, this, is from, this is from Yao Ling Shi's text. Quote, born into an old fashioned family at Ping Shi, I was afflicted with the pain of foot binding when I was seven years old. It was the first lunar month of my seventh year that my ears were pierced and fitted with gold earrings. I was told that a girl had to suffer twice through ear piercing and foot binding. Binding started the second lunar month. Mother consulted references in order to select an auspicious day for it. I wept and hid in a neighbor's home, but mother found me, scolded me, and dragged me home. She shut the bedroom door, boiled water, and from a box withdrew binding shoes, knife, needle, and thread. I begged for a one-day postponement, but mother refused. Quote, today is a lucky day, she said. If bound today, your feet will never hurt. If bound tomorrow, they will. She washed and placed alum on my feet and cut the toenails. Now, remember, alum, alum is an astringent that contracts, cause the muscles to, the flesh to contract. She placed alum on my feet and cut the toenails. She then bent my toes toward the plantar, plantar with the binding cloth 10 feet long and two inches wide doing the right foot first and then the left. She finished binding and ordered me to walk. But when I did, the pain proved unbearable. So recall then that this girl is having her, she has her feet broken and then is forced to walk on her broken feet. That night, mother wouldn't let me remove the shoes. My feet felt on fire and I couldn't sleep. Mother struck me for crying. On the following days, I tried to hide, but was forced to walk. Mother hit me on my hands and feet for resisting. Beatings and curses were my lot for covertly loosening the wrappings. The feet were washed and rebound after three or four days with alum added. After several months, all toes but the big one were pressed against the inner surface. Whenever I ate fish or freshly killed meat, my feet would swell and the pus would drip. Mother criticized me for placing pressure on the heel and walking, saying that my feet would never assume a pretty shape. Mother would remove the bindings and wipe the blood and pus which dripped from my feet. She told me that only with removal of the flesh could my feet become slender. If I mistakenly punctured a sore, the blood gushed like a stream. My somewhat fleshy big toes were bound with small pieces of cloth and forced upwards to assume a new moon shape. Every two weeks, I changed to new shoes. Each new pair was one to, ten, one to, one to two tenths of an inch smaller than the previous one. The shoes were unyielding and it took pressure to get into them. Though I wanted to sit passively on the Kang, my mother forced me to move around after changing more than 10 pairs of shoes, my feet were reduced to a little over four inches. I had been binding for a month when my younger sister star started. When no one was around, we would weep together. In summer, my feet smelled offens offensively because of pus and blood. In winter, my feet felt cold because of lack of circulation and hurt if they got too near the Kong and were struck with warm air currents. Four of the toes were curled in like so many dead caterpillars. No outsider would ever have believed they belonged to a human being. It took two years to achieve the three-inch model." Close quote. Well, this is quite a, a, a description of what it was to have one's feet bind. The result was an extremely deformed foot that, that uh, must be given daily attention 
uh, all the way from you know the moment it's found until one <laughs> is in old age. Um, well, I think that that one of the best ways to understand the lives of women in foot binding is to understand the 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 ideas of what made a woman quote desirable in late imperial China. Um, well, the first thing is is you have the Song Dynasty progenitor of Neo Confucianism by the name of Zhu Xi. Uh, he was a major proponent of rigid self-control and especially the restraint of, of women. So women were supposed to be self-restrained and also restrained within their environment. So they had to be restrained uh, personally, but they also had to be restrained. I mean, they had to restrain themselves. They also had to be restrained uh, externally by the environment that they're in, and even by, by having their feet bind, right? Um, being restrained as a woman re involved both having the feet restrained, having you be culturally restrained, and architecturally restrained. Uh, as we talked about in the previous lecture, right, um, there was a domain at the very back of, of houses where women, especially unmarried women, were expected to remain. So Jushi, what did he do? He combined Buddhist and Taoist, I'm sorry, he combined Buddhist and Confucian, not Taoist, he combined Buddhist and Confucian uh, uh, ideas with some Taoist esoteric thought with Confucian, Confucian ideas. So Buddhism mostly, a little Taoism, combined them with, with Confucian ideas and, and um, really came up with this idea that was anti-desire in a sense that was very Buddhist. You know, desire is a bad thing. And so he, um, uh, he really advocated the idea of restraining any, any desire and even restraining things that might potentially cause desire, such as beautiful women. So he was eventually made the magistrate of Fujian province. And he was re reportedly so disturbed by the fact that many women were walking around outside that he, he and he thought that it, it, it basically uh, uh, caused, he thought, all manner of, of temptation and lasciviousness. So according to uh, tradition, Zhu Xi then forced all women, young and old, to bind their feet. And the area in Fujian where he uh, served as magistrate, uh, of course, was then called the, the uh, quote, Sea of Canes, because the women had to use canes to just get about, because they could no longer walk without the aid of a walking stick. And this is one of the principles of what we call containment. Let me just go back so you can still look at Zhu Xi for a moment. But uh, men should contain their desires and women should be contained indoors. Novels highlighted this idea by, by, um, by integrating into their narrative uh, a notion that any kind of containment, like the containment of a building, the containment of a, of a woman, you know, these things should be, you know, they, they represent and facilitate containment. Breach, uh, 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 leaks of containment uh, basically engender uh, turbulence, right? So, uh, for example, one might have in a novel a, a, a young scholar walking through a Chinese street and, and, and accidentally uh, one of the doors of the, of the estate will be open and, and a, a kind of breach in the containment of the home. And the young scholar will see a young beauty inside the estate. And because, he, because there was a, an uncontained moment, a moment where the window was open or the door was open and he saw this beautiful woman, that he will plot. To, to acquire her, and that will essentially facilitate the turbulence of the novel afterwards. So to avoid, uh, to avoid turbulence, to avoid desire, there should be no leaks in the proper world of containment. Uh, these things uh, uh, cause desire to essentially grow out of check. So men should study, and they should act according to ritual behavior. Uh, good men, according to Neo-Confucianism, should study, and, and, uh, and, and good women, according to Neo-Confucianism, should stay at home in the women's quarters, since women are uh, both the, the, the cause of desire and, uh, according to the Neo-Confucian ideals, they were particularly prone to succumbing to desire and stirring up uh, chaos. Uh, well, the model woman, according to these ideals, stays at home in her room and she embroiders, for example. Think of Xue Baochai, who does just that. She is the model Confucian woman. She knows the classics. She's very much like Ban Zhao. She's well-read, but she, but she remains at home and, and, and does womanly things. Well, um, 
the Neo-Confucian notion of containment is, 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 I think, most notably seen in the practice of foot binding. Um, and I, I have to say now that everything I've said, you will see at some level appearing throughout the narrative of the novel Dream of the Red Chamber. Again, generally, uh, gen, uh, uh, generally women, uh, men, let me start over. For the most part, men are to stay anchored to their studies while women uh, see to the needs of the household and maintain a perfectly ordered society with perfectly bound feet, essentially bound for what is practically the pleasure of, of her husband. Um, Feng Ji Tsai wrote a great novel called Three Inch Golden Lotus, and he has this quote in it, quote, girls have their feet bound precisely to keep them from running around. Have you ever seen older girls moving about on the streets, close quote. Well, according to uh, Neo-Confucian ideas, women who move about are dangerous women, and foot binding is, is part of this ideal. Uh, Wang Shifeng, in many ways, is a dangerous woman. Uh, she has much freedom of movement in the, in the narrative. But popular bound foot prints tell us much about the purpose of, of foot binding. Um, there is a very powerfully erotic dimension to foot binding in Chinese society. They're usually described with, with such nomenclature as green onions, lotus petals, bamboo shoots, and a new moon. But to conclude then, to conclude then, to understand Qing Dynasty China and the novel Hong Lomong, Dream of the Red Chamber, one must understand the material culture that the characters of, uh, characters of the novel uh, is, is steeped in. When Lin Dayu, uh, and here's a print of this very scene in the novel, when Lin Dayu finds Bao Yu in the garden reading uh, Romance of the Western Chamber, she covers his eyes and says, guess who? Um, well, he's reading a very passionate novel about passionate romance, and then she becomes addicted to it when she finds out what he's reading. Bao Yu and Dai Yu represent passion, the passion for things and the passion for people. In fact, this, I think, is why Cao Xueqin, the author of Hong Lomong, describes objects and pe people in such detail in the novel, because the eyes attract, the eyes attract us to the sights that entrap us. And that is the Buddhist message. And that also is the message of what is to be authentically passionate from the point of view of the cult of Qing. Well, um, uh, I'll end there. If, uh, uh, as I always am uh, desiring to say, Junim and Shanti Jian Kang, I wish you all good health. And if you want to know what happens in the next uh, lecture, please stay tuned to the next post. Thank you.